derive it real quick. Um, so we'll start by deriving and then we'll solve some quadratic equation. That's the plan for it. So let's start first with the derivation itself. <clears throat> so we're going to start with standard form here. Okay, this is our standard formula of quadratic, where a, b, and c are coefficients. a, b, and c are some numbers in this case. They are some real numbers. And if you think back to the completing the square method, the idea in completing the square was to always start by taking whatever the constant was and moving it over. We would divide by a, we go through the process. Let's, let's take the same process, but now we're going to do it without any numbers. So you can watch if you want. You don't have to actually like, write all this down. This is not going to be uh, a testable material, but it could be something that might help you if you forget how to actually use the quadratic formula. So I'm going to start by moving C over. OK, I'm going to start by moving C over first. Then I'm going to do exactly what we've done in the past. If A is some number, I always divide everything by A. So I'm going to divide everything by A, which makes the next line x squared plus b over a x equals negative c over a. Now b over a is a coefficient, so if you want to think of it that way, that might be a nicer way to think about it. Right? And b is being divided by a, and the x is the actual variable term. So this is like a number here. This is a number right here. And now we have a 1 in front, which is what we always want. We then take whatever b is, which is in this case b over a, we take whatever this is, we have it, we square it, and we add that to both sides. Remember completing the square? Go back to completing the square if you're not sure what I'm saying right now. If you recall, you take whatever this term is right here, you have it, square it, add it here, and add it here. So if I take half of this, what's the quick way to have a fraction? What did I tell you? That's the fast way to half a fraction always. Double the denominator. So think of this, when you want to have it, as b over 2a. And then you're going to square that and add it to both sides. So I'm going to take b over 2a and add that squared to both sides. <clears throat> now, although it looks like where are we going with this, and this doesn't make any sense, this left side can now be factored. I know it doesn't look like it, but this is like saying x squared plus 2x plus, in this case, what would it be? 2 x and that would just be a plus 1. And then x plus 1, x plus 1. But the idea to recognize here is that this always factors. Remember, it always factors into x plus or minus, depending on the original sign. In this case, since there's a plus sign here, this will carry down as a plus sign. And it always factors into whatever the b value is divided by 2. And the b value right now was b over a, so it's just the b over 2a. And that's what that will factor into on the left-hand side. Okay, and this is something that we talked about last class in the square that you don't really have to know because it's always going to work this way. Whenever you complete the square, whatever you use as half of this will always appear here. So remember, it was b divided by 2a gives you half of this, and then we square it. Well, the b over 2a just carries down right here. And if you're not sure, you don't see this works, you can close this out. You know, again, this is the last term. We can double this to get the middle term. On the right-hand side, though, we can recognize here that it looks like we might be able to simplify a little bit of the work here on the right. We have the negative c over a. And it looks like I'm going to write this <coughs> as b squared over 4a squared. Okay, I can do that to start to make that a little bit easier. Now... <coughs> Here, my goal is going to be eventually to solve for x. My goal is going to be to get x by itself. So on the left-hand side, I can, consider, I can consider foiling that out, but it would get me back to the bush. It would get me back to right here. So if I foil this out, it doesn't help. So I want to take the square root to get rid of the square, but I kind of want this to look a little bit nicer first. So I'm going to find a common denominator on the right-hand side. What would the common denominator on the right-hand side be? What would the common denominator be on the right-hand side of the equation? 4a. Yeah, 4a squared. squared. So we're missing a 4a here, and we're missing a 4a here. So let's multiply this whole thing by 4a over 4a. That'll make this 4a squared, 4a squared, common denominator. So the right-hand side, I can write as one denominator now. 
the numerator becomes, and stay with me here, we're going to have a negative 4ac plus b squared. Okay, again, make sure you understand this. This is a negative here. 4 times a times c is this. The negative comes out in front. Plus a b squared carries over. Same denominator, make it one denominator. For those of you that know the quadratic formula, are you seeing it already? Are you actually seeing it, right? Do you see what I mean by are you seeing it? If you know it from the past, if you don't know it, it's not going to be obvious. But for those that know it, d squared minus 4ac. You're starting to see the quadratic formula evolve from this. On the left-hand side, we leave it alone for now. On the next step, we want to consider the fact that we have to get rid of the square. So we're going to take the square root of both sides. The left-hand side just remains with what we had when we take the square root of it. It's gone now, right, the square. The right-hand side, though, I put a plus or minus always first, and then it's the square root of this whole thing. I'm going to write the numerator in this form. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'm just going to write it in the form that we're used to seeing it for the quadratic formula. So again, negative 4ac plus b squared is the same thing as b squared plus a negative 4ac. So I'm just switching that order. Now, if I take the square root of a perfect square, that works, right? The square root of 4a squared is just going to be what? What is the denominator if I'm going to take the square root of 4a squared? So it becomes what? 2a. 2a. And that's all over 2a is the quadratic formula, if you remember the way it goes. That's your denominator coming into play. So it's going to be plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over... 2a. Again, the numerator cannot be square rooted because there's a minus sign. For those of you that want to take the square root of b squared, remember these cannot be canceled because of the minus sign. But here, this is a prop. These are multipliers. Since they're multipliers and they're both perfect squares, they can simplify. That becomes a 2, that becomes an a. And yes, we've been doing the absolute value of a couple times. Remember that? When we take the square root of a squared? So here we have a plus or minus. We're looking for two roots. We don't need absolute value of that here. The left hand side is still x plus b over 2, uh, b over 2a. How do I get rid of the b over 2a? Subtract it. On the left hand side, I don't want this b over 2a here. My goal is to get x by itself. So I'm going to subtract this whole thing and move it over here. And when I subtract it, do you remember what I told you? Where do I put it? Let me solve for completing the square, Isabel. In front of the plus or minus, very good. So I'm going to put it as a negative, that's the idea of subtraction, in front of the plus or minus. And that's the quadratic formula. Okay? A lot of you know it as one fraction, and I'll write it as one fraction at the very end. But that is the quadratic formula right there. That'll give us the roots of any polynomial if it's in standard form, any quadratic polynomial in standard form. Okay, so you're going to see it written this way in your textbook or anywhere else that's published all over 2a. And again, why can I do that? Because it's a common denominator. Mark that nicely. And we ended up with a 2a here and a 2a here in both denominators. So therefore, one common denominator works nicely. So the plus or minus up top carrying over between here, the negative b in the front. You really do need to memorize this. If you have trouble, think of, uh, what is it, Pop Goes the Weasel, I think, right? Is the tune you can remember to this? Any, any of your teachers sing you that one? I'm not singing, but like, you can hum it, kind of. It's not, I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to be singing it, but I'll hum it real quick. Um, but you, you can think of Pop Goes the Weasel. Um, so I had a teacher who used to say, like, I'm going to sing it. X equals negative B plus or minus the square root. B squared minus 4ac all over 2 and pop goes the means. Okay? So you can think of something to hunt. So whatever you want to do, honestly. If you need a mnemonic device, that's, that's useful. There are other tunes that people have used for it as well. But this is what we need to know where a, b, and c are the coefficients from the original equation. Okay, from the original equation. So now that we have this tool under our belt, we can solve any quadratic even if it can't be factored. But you're going to say, you know what, in 7 and 1 we proved that, and that's true. In 7 and 1, with completing the square, we showed that with completing the square, even the most complicated fractions or the most complicated coefficients can actually be worked through with completing the square. The same thing carries over here. 
Okay, whether it's completing the square or quadratic formula, at this point, it's up to you to choose which method you want. Okay, if on the test I say, please solve this using completing the square, I want to see that you can complete the square. If I say solve this using quadratic formula, follow the directions. But if it's not given to you to solve one way or the other, you can factor, you can complete the square, or you can use the quadratic formula. There are three ways now you can solve any quadratic. Factoring, completing the square, or the quadratic formula. Any of those are acceptable if the problem doesn't designate which way it wants to be solved. Um, word problems, you're going to notice that it is useful to use the quadratic formula when you have a lot of decimals. So those problems with like the rockets or the objects that are launched with certain velocities that are decimals and the gravitational constant is a decimal, it can be really useful to use the quadratic formula there, not really completing the square very much, okay? Not as much factoring either. So let's look at an example of this now. So we have 5x squared plus 4x minus 2 equals 0, and the question is to solve this equation. Solve this equation. So you can use completing the square from 7 to 1, and it would work. Divide by A, move the C over, half of B, square to both sides, and go through the process. That's totally fine. But because now we know the quadratic formula, it's actually easier just to plug right into the quadratic formula. Now, it's up to you to start. You can start with the quadratic formula, or you can plug in right away. If you feel very confident, and you've used this in the past, and you want to plug right in to start, that's fine. If you haven't practiced it much, maybe take the approach I'm taking to start. And that approach is to simply start by rewriting the formula x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. What's under the radical is really important, and we're going to really touch upon that in 7.3. And then in 7.4, we're going to go back to talk about that more. But for now, because your test is next week, I'm not going to go into too much detail with that part yet. So all I have to do at this point is plug in. What is a, what is b, and what is c? It's just my coefficients, provided it's in the correct form. So make sure that your equation is in the right order. This is A, this is B, and this is C. Recognize that C is a negative 2 here. The sign does matter for each term. The A, the B, and the C values have indicated signs on them, so make sure to carry them down. So I've got x equals negative B, so that's going to be a negative 4, plus or minus the square root of B squared, that's 4 squared, minus 4, times a times c all over 2a. <clears throat> Let me know if there's any confusing part to this because I want to make sure that it's not unclear. I'm simply plugging in for a, b, and c. a is 5, b is 4, and c is negative 2. Simply plug each other. The hard part about this section is honestly just to have the formula memorized. That's the only hard part. Everything else is plugging in. Remembering the plus or minus, then you get two answers here. Okay, remembering that there's a plus or minus, we're going to get two answers. So negative 4 plus or minus is all going to be over 10. What's under the square root? You can do it all in your head if you want, and that might be useful. It's a nice technique to be able to just comp uh, compute this under your, in your head and move it on to the radical. So what, what are we going to get here? Uh, well, 16 plus 40 is that 56. Yeah, and that's fine. Do it that way. So think of this as the first part, and that's 16. A negative negative is really a positive, and that's going to give us 40. 16 and 40 is 56. So this is root 56. Now, what does that become? I want to simplify as much as possible always, right? So what can come out of 56? Um, 8 to 8 by 7, but neither are perfect squares. Yeah. 4 is a perfect square, though, right? Yeah. So if I have 8, I've got to double the 7. So I can use 4 times 14. Does that work? See what, see what I did in my head there? I have 8, and I double 7 to make the equivalent of expression. So negative 4 plus or minus, and this will be root 4 times root 14, all over 10. <clears throat> Continuing this down. Again, negative 4 plus or minus 2 root 14 all over 10. I could stop here, but it looks like I can simplify further, so I should do it. Right? If the problem asks me to get the roots, I want to have the roots in simplest form. The 14, I can't go anywhere. Please make yourself a note. This is not going to reduce because it's under the radical. This is not under the radical. Remember, if this were under a radical and they were all under radicals, then you can reduce all the under radicals. But the parts that are not under radicals, are the parts that reduce. 
And these are all multiples of 2. So take a 2 out of each of these. And if you don't see that, take a 2 out of the numerator as a GCF. Take a 2 out of here, which you leave a 5 on. Simply reducing each by 2. So make this, this, and this half of what they each were. So that becomes a 2, that becomes a 1, and that becomes a 5. So my answer is going to become negative 2 plus or minus. I'm not going to write 1 root 14. I'm just going to write root 14, and that's all over 5. So these will give me my two answers. Again, one of them with a positive using, sorry, one of them using a plus, one of them using a minus. Now, it's important to note, maybe jot this down, that your answers are not opposites of each other. It's not like one answer is 3 and the other answer is negative 3. Is that clear? Again, your answers are not opposites of each other. That's a common misconception. The answers are binomial conjugates. And you can find out what the decimal representation is by doing negative 2 plus root 14 all divided by 5. Negative 2 minus root 14 all divided by 5. And you're going to get two approximate decimal values. Those approximates, do I have them written down? I don't, of course. Okay, we can get approximate decimal. I did it on the next example, actually, to show you that. Okay, but we can get two approximate decimal values, but those decimal values will not be opposites of one another. The plus or minus is not like saying if I get 2.7 as one root, the other root's going to be negative 2.7. That's not the case. It could happen. That could happen. Absolutely could happen. And that will actually happen when there's no B value. So I jot that note down. It doesn't matter as much right now. It will matter later in this chapter. But when B is equal to 0, the roots will be opposites of each other. When B is equal to 0. And we'll see why that comes about in the next section. We'll really talk more about that. So for now, let's just practice another example. Okay? I want to get through two more examples today. One more, one example now with decimals, and then the last example when we have imaginary roots. So let's revisit this problem. Let's take a look again at the 1D vertical motion problem. This is your standard physics problem with uh, projectile motion. And this is only up and down. You're going to look at left and right also in physics. So recall the formula given is y of t equals v0 of t minus 4.9 t squared, where v0 is what again? What was that v0 called? This is the initial velocity. Very good, the initial velocity. It says that a projectile was fired from a cliff with a speed of 20 meters per second, vertically up. If it were fired vertically down, that would be a negative velocity to start. And you would use negative 20 for v0. But because this is fired vertically up in the positive y direction, the v0 value is going to be positive 20. Okay, v0 is positive 20 from that statement. If it had said downward, it would be negative 20. Okay, if it had said downward. <clears throat> um, it says, if the height of the cliff is 50 meters... Now again, the projectile is fired from a cliff, from a cliff. So the way you draw a cliff is like this. Put a projectile here at the top, show that it's fired upward. It's gonna be launched and it's gonna come back down around and eventually splat it to the ground. And it has potential energy you're learning physics that converts to kinetic energy, which is motion. But the idea here is that we wanna figure out two things. If the height is 50 meters at the cliff to start, the question to start for part A says, when will it reach the ground? And then the second part says, when will it pass the top of the cliff on the way down? So we are focused on two points in time. For part A, let's use red. We are focused on when it gets to this location in the diagram. And for part B, I'll use blue. For that part, we're focused on when it gets to right here in the diagram. Again, when will it reach the ground is physically saying when is it going to lose all of its height and hit the ground. That was the easy part. That's part A. Part B, though, says when will it pass, when will it pass the top of the cliff on the way down. Here's the top of the cliff. It's going to pass it. It's going to start at the top of the cliff, and then it's going to pass it right when it gets to here, at the blue mark, okay, on the way down. So for part A, for part A, it could be a little bit confusing. How am I going to go about part A? 
What's the height of the projectile when it reaches the ground? When it reaches the ground. And there's two ways to do this. There are two ways to do this. Mora, what, what do you recommend I do? Uh, zero. Okay, so if you're going to call that zero, what would your starting height be then? Your starting height would be 50. 50. And you can do it that way. So listen to what Mora just mentioned. He said, let's call the ground zero and call the starting height 50. If you do that though, just so you're aware, you have to tack on a 50 up here, see where I'm pointing? In the equation. Because this is the height function, and this is given the initial velocity, this is the acceleration of gravity, but the initial height has to be taken into account somewhere. So if we're going to call the ground zero, then this has to be a plus 50 at the end here. Now, instead of that, and I want you to see it's the same answer, I could also call this zero to start. You can call where you start zero. And if I call where I start zero, what will this height then be? Negative 50. And I approach it that way, and I'll explain why in a minute. It'll be a little easier. So let's call this ground level for now. Okay, and I'll do that by designating the diagram h equals zero. And saying, you know what, we'll call this the initial height of zero. We'll call that ground level. It's not ground level. I know it's not. It's the height of the cliff. But I'm going to call that starting height of zero. If that's a starting height of zero again, then this height down here is going to be negative 50 meters. And you know what? It gets to some max height, and that's going to be some positive value. But this problem is not concerned with the max height. This is not concerned with the max height. But yes, the max height would be some positive quantity, because it's above what we're calling h equals zero. So this max height might be 20 meters, 30 meters. It doesn't matter right now. OK, we're not asked about that, that facet of it. So we're trying to figure out when it gets to a height of 50 meters. That's part A. Again, part A is asking, when does it get to this height of 50, negative 50 meters? So I start with my height function for part A. Here's my height function. And I think I called it h of t last time we did this. H of t, h for height, y. y is like a vertical height. x is like a horizontal length. So I'm calling it y here. It's the same thing. I want you to see if there's any um, representation that means the same. So the 20 is the initial velocity. That's 20t minus 4.9t squared. And because we're trying to figure out when the height is negative 50 meters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace y of t with negative 50 meters. So we're trying to figure out when it actually gets to a height of negative 50. So this is how I'm going to approach solving part n. When is the height negative 50 when the velocity initially is 20, and this again is the gravity part of the equation, figure out the time. So we're going to solve for t, and we can see here that it could be very useful to use completing the square or quadratic formula. Again, because of the decimal component for n. The decimal here makes it very difficult to factor this. I made it work for you guys, if you remember when you did this problem in the past. When you did this problem with factoring techniques only, I made it work out that this number was 4.9, this was 9.8, this was like 19.6, so they were all divisible by 4.9, and you were able to take out a GCF and factor. Now, I'm telling you now, you're not going to be able to factor this, okay, I'm gonna, for this test, for this kind of a problem. So for this problem, you're going to want to use the quadratic formula or, or completing the square. I would recommend the quadratic formula. A decimal is a mess for completing the square. So I absolutely do not recommend completing the square here. I recommend the quadratic formula the minute you have a decimal in place. Now, had we taken the approach Morrow suggested, we would get the equation we're about to get. So I want you to see that. So if I move the 50 over now, right, move the 50 over by adding it over to the right-hand side. Here's what it becomes. The whole equation becomes this. So again, put, the, put it in the correct order. I've got negative 4.9t squared. I've got a positive 20t. And then I'm going to take this negative 50 on the left-hand side and add it to the right-hand side. And take a look at the equation more. This is the equation you said we should start with. You said, let's call the initial value that we're starting here as a height of 50, and we'll call the ground zero. And if that were the case more, we would have a zero here for the ground, right? And the positive 50 on the right-hand side. 
Okay, so either approach is absolutely okay, just recognizing that there is some initial height in this equation. So if you're going to use that initial height, where would it go? It would get tacked on right here to be like a plus y0. Okay, take a look at the, look at the problem at the top there. If you want to use that equation with a plus y0, you can call the initial height 50, and then call this height 0, and you literally get this. Initial height is 50, and the height you're going toward is the ground, which you can call the ground 0. And go ahead and solve this. The solution to this is actually the easy part. The hard part of this problem is going to be the word problem to set it up. The easy part is actually doing the math. It's just plug and chug. There's negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. decimal under the square root, and because I'm looking for time, if I said to you, how much time has elapsed, would you say, two plus or minus radical seven has elapsed? It doesn't make sense to say that, right? If you're physically giving an entity, a quantity as an answer, and you want some significance from the number, you want to know two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, how much time has physically elapsed, you would not give an answer with radicals in it. And because I have a decimal under the radical, it's not even like that that's a nice answer anyway. So this is an example where you probably want to use an approximation and use the actual decimal value you get here. So let's go ahead and write what we would get from that. If that's the case, it would be t equals, again, negative 20 plus or minus some number all over negative 9.8. Now, what is that number? It's for you guys to practice in your calculator, right? Take your calculators out, please. Take your calculator out. And simply practice running through this. Okay, there's a lot of room for error here under the radical. And I've seen that before. So practice it. Practice it. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. If you don't mind, just because I want to get used to using this, because we're going to do a lot more of this in the chapter. Okay? Especially with graphing, we're going to use it a lot. So it's up to you to approach this. You can put it under the radical and do it all in one line. Or some of you like to do what's underneath first, and that's totally fine. You can do 20 squared, and then to that add, right, because this is minus a negative. Take a look. A minus negative here is really positive. So I would do 20 squared and then add the product of these three numbers to that. And then take the square root of that whole thing. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do in this case. We're going to take an approximate. So really, I'm going to make this symbol. See what I changed that symbol into? I make an approximation symbol because I am approximating the actual value. Hell, do you have a number? Did you get just this right here? Yeah, 37. 37? What would it be? Is it actually 37 or is it like 37.14? Let's keep it with that just for a minute. So we'll leave that for now and just carry a couple decimals until the very last step and then we'll round the last step. Okay, check that you got this. If you didn't get 37.14, take a look at your math. Again, do 20 squared plus the quantity, 4 times 4.9 times 50. You sure? It's 37.148, so you're approximating 37.5. Is it right? Yeah, actually, that's right, right? It's 37 squared, 40 squared would be 1,600. This is 400. This is 200 times 5 is 1,000. 1,000 and 400 is 1,400. 1,600 and 40. Yes. Good. Good. Now, how do I get the two answers from this? I take one with a positive root and one with the negative. So I literally just break this into two answers at this point. I've got negative 20 plus 37.14 all over negative 9.8. And then negative 20 minus 37.14 all over negative 9.8. And I guess it would be 1.5 because you said it was 1.48. I'll tack on the H to be a little more precise for now. Again, it's always an estimation, but try to carry as many decimals as possible until the last line. Notice again, the only difference is this symbol right here. Okay, the numerator. 
in the numerator. It's the only difference in symbol. And it's the middle of the numerator, not the front of the numerator. I'm going to get answers for now. Let's see. It looks like negative 1.75. And that would be the bottom one. No, oh, no, that would be the top one, actually, right? Because this is going to become, let's see. This would be a positive numerator over a negative denominator. This is going to yield a negative answer. That's correct. And this is going to be a negative numerator, but divided by a negative denominator gives you a positive answer for the second one. Yeah. Okay, around 5.8. So I've got two answers here for the time it takes this projectile to land on the ground. It started on a cliff height, which is called a desk right here. It's called a desk the cliff. It was launched up. It went up. It turned around. It went all the way back and hit the ground. Did it take negative 1.75 seconds or did it take 5.83 seconds? What do you think? 5.83. Yeah, it's kind of negative time. It's just logical. You can't have a negative time. In physics, you'll learn about where that negative time comes into play, actually. And it has to do with like, going backward through the cliff kind of at the time, instead of going in this direction. It has to do with going through the cliff, which you wouldn't do, so it doesn't matter. And okay, 5.83 is absolutely the answer you're going to choose here. Okay, this is one of those times where you have to use your common sense and context clues to only choose one of the two answers. Remember how I said you check your answer or reject possibly one of the solutions? This is not as much of a rejection as it is a, you know, it's not sensitive. You can't have a negative time, so I have to rule that out. I have to rule that out. <clears throat> so let's just quickly zoom out for a second so we can see this problem in the big picture again because we're going to do part B now. Again, the big picture here was that we started at a height of zero and ended at a height of negative 50 meters. Okay? Again, we started at a height of zero and ended at a height of negative 50 meters. Now, for part B, we're still going to start at a height of zero, but where are we ending? Zero. At zero. Very good, Alex. Think about this. Excuse me. If the projectile is the apple pencil on the desk right here, okay? And this is what we're calling ground level. It's not. I know the ground is really ground level, but I'm calling this a height of zero. And it gets launched, and it goes up, and it comes all the way back around, and we're trying to find the time it takes to get to right here. Well, it's still technically at a height of zero. Yes, it went up to maybe 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters, came back down <clears throat> another 20 or 30 meters. But when it passes the cliff, <clears throat> it's back at a height of zero. It's back at a height of zero. And yes, it may, maybe it traveled 30 meters up and 30 meters back down. But those 30 meters up and down, they kind of cancel each other in displacement. We're going to use that phrase in physics for the displacement or the height. Okay? Yes, it traveled 60 meters by going 30 up and 30 down. But where is it physically? It's at the same height it started. So it's still technically at a height of zero when it reaches this location on the way down. Okay? So we're going to call the height zero for part B. So what I'm going to do to solve for part B over here for part B, I'm going to use the same governing equation we started with, but instead of calling the height negative 50, Right? I'm going to take the exact same equation I have from this line right here and use it again. But I'm not going to use negative 50. I'm going to say I'm going to use a height of 0 instead. Now more, I want to point something out because you made a good point earlier. If we had called this a starting height of 50, right? if we called that a starting height of 50, we would have a plus 50 on the end right here. Right? We would have a plus 50 on the end, which is the same thing as having a plus 50 over here. So if I called this starting height 50 
and it went up and it ended right here, which is also a height of 50. It would be putting a 50 as a star unit here, put a 50 as the height when it gets back to the cliff, and a 50 on both sides, what would happen? The 50 is on both sides. What happens to those 50s? It's on both sides. They cancel out. They cancel out. I mean, technically, again, if I had this, you don't have to write it. If I had this instead, and I took the approach that Mora had mentioned with the starting height, it's the exact same thing. This is an approach you will take in physics. That's why I'm saying, you know what, it's not a bad idea to see this now. Again, if you had a starting height of 50, and you want to know when you get back to the same starting height, it means you're getting back to 50, these would cancel each other out, and this would become exactly what you have right here. So either approach is okay in this case. But because we're calling the cliff a height of zero, we want to know when we get back to that height on the way down, it's still getting back to a height of zero. Why is this an easier equation to solve than the last one? Because there's no c value. There's no c value. Look at the quadratic formula without the c value. Where is the c value in the quadratic formula in yellow here? What number was C in this case? What number was C? Christian, what was C? 50. 50. So watch this. Don't do it, just watch this, ready? I cover this up, because now 50 is really zero, isn't it? If there's no C value, what is C? C is zero. So this whole thing would be gone, wouldn't it? So now when I do this problem, this is just gonna be the square root of 20 squared. Right, this is gonna be the square root of 20 squared, which is just 20. So I don't really need a quadratic formula to solve this, actually. I can use the quadratic formula for this part, but I don't need it. Whenever you don't have a C, write yourself a note. If B, if B or C equals zero, you can solve, you can solve without the quadratic formula, just by factoring. Whenever B or C are zero, you can always solve without the quadratic formula. Whenever b or c are 0, solve without it. So how would I approach solving this equation in blue without the quadratic formula? What comes out of both terms? I said factoring, so consider factoring. Sebastian? T comes out of both terms. Okay, and that leaves me with a 20 minus 4.9t. That's why this problem is a little bit easier for part C. You don't need the quadratic formula. You can use it, and you'll get this answer. You would get these answers, I should say. Okay, you would get both of these answers. And then I have to solve this one for T. process here gives me 4.08. The left hand side gives me zero. Can somebody explain the significance of this answer here? What is the significance of t equals zero as an answer to this problem? Why is that an answer to this problem? Because the first thing the initial is zero. Yeah. The initial time is zero and the initial height is zero. So the question was being asked as, when do I reach cliff height? I reach the cliff height to start and then again, after how much time has elapsed? 4.08 seconds. So again, if I'm drawing a diagram and you want to visualize this, if I'm drawing a diagram and you want to visualize this, this is the time equals zero to start. The object is launched. It goes up, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. It comes back around, comes back around, and this, is time equals 4.08 seconds right here. And this is time equals zero to start right there. So that's your trajectory as a function of time. Time is around four seconds when it gets back to the cliff. So about how long does it take to get to max height? About how long does it take to get to max height? About. Four seconds. Well, it takes about four seconds to get to there. 
Okay. Yeah? So like two. Okay. About two seconds. So what Isabella picked up on is that from beginning to where I get back to cliff height, there is symmetry. There is absolutely symmetry here, from here to here. If I keep going with this projectile and I go all the way to the ground, there is no symmetry anymore. But for this portion of the graph that we just drew, this portion of the trajectory that we just drew, there is indeed symmetry. But yes, this item or this object would continue down and eventually hit the ground. And we said earlier that it takes 5.83 seconds, right? Wasn't that the number to hit the ground? 5.83. So that means that this is time equals 5.83 right here. So if we wanted to, we could find out the time that elapsed here if we subtract the two. If we wanted to, that would be 1.75 seconds. Okay, so try to make sense of physically what's happening here. It takes about two seconds to get to max height, another two seconds to come back to cliff height, and then another 1.75 seconds to get to the bottom. And if I add it together, the 4.08 plus the 1.75, I would get 5.83. Again, 5.83 is the total time, so I can add together all my little time segments along the way. We have one more to finish. One more. Any questions on this one? I have a question in yeah. general. Um, so if you have like, the rootfinder on the calculator, I feel like you set the calculator. Yeah, but you're, you're probably going to have to do this without a calculator in that part of the test. So don't become dependent on it. But I'm going to actually show you, as like a little mini computer science lesson after this test, how to program the quadratic formula using your own coding language in the calculator, which is kind of cool. But it's the same thing the rootfinder is doing. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do that actually, but I'm going to wait until after this test because I don't want you guys to become dependent on a calculator for this one. But when you get to the final exam and you're doing these problems and it's like a multiple choice, by all means, use a calculator program for your role. So I'll show you how to write that program for sure. But I'm going to wait until after this test to go into that stuff. So yeah, expect to not have a calculator on this portion of the test. If it's decimals, then obviously you're going to have to approximate it and I'll tell you to use your calculator to approximate it. But there's a good chance I'll make them integers so that the answers are somewhat reasonable for those. Last example, the only reason I wanted to do this is to show you that you can get imaginary answers also. Okay, we can get imaginary answers and we'll be able to show that right away. So let's start by moving everything over to one side. So let's move the three over first. And now we've got A, B, and C. I know the formula says X equals, in this case, M. Negative b, so negative negative 5, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. So this is a negative negative 5 here in the very front, which makes that a positive 5. Okay, so you could have gone to that right away, obviously. This is all going to be over 8. And then the question becomes, what's under the radical? Now, this is going to be negative 5 squared, which is positive 25. Get any point to know that this is a positive. And that's going to be 25 minus, unless you, it looks like 48. 4 by 4 is 16. 16 by 3 is 48. So it's going to be 25 minus 48. 25 minus 48. So we have to consider that we're going to get a negative quantity here underneath the radical. And again, 25 minus 48 is negative 23. Negative 23. So because I have a negative under the radical, it doesn't mean it's going to make it any harder. It just means that the answer I'm going to get here is going to be some sort of imaginary answer. So it's going to be 5 plus or minus i root 23 all over 8. So if I'm writing this in standard complex form, okay, standard complex form would be 5 eighths plus or minus root 23 over 8 i. Feel free to just type them into Y1 and look at the graph 
and find your x-intercepts. You'll see those will match up with your roots. This example will not give you x-intercepts because the roots are matching. Okay, that'll be a graph that's floating. I talked about that already. Please make sure you look at the homework on Moodle. I think I made the homework for this section. I forget if I made it due tomorrow or not. But there are going to be practice word problems on documents and handouts. So please look at Moodle and take a look at the homework I